Welcome to the ProcureTech Podcast, where we aim to excite and inspire you about how technology will shape our profession's future. I'm your host, James Meads, and I worked in corporate procurement for 16 years before starting my own business as a content creator and consultant in the procurement technology space. I'm deeply convinced that procurement must become less technocratic and embrace the entrepreneurial spirit and creativity if we're ever going to shake off our image of being a process-obsessed, box-ticking function. You definitely won't find vanilla content on here, and we're not afraid to tackle some controversial topics and tell it like it really is. So if that's your thing, now let's jump right into this week's episode. Yes, hello, and a very warm welcome to the ProcureTech podcast and to series four of the podcast. And wow, when I started this podcast in March 2020, little did I know that three years later, uh, I would still be recording and uh, and about to launch a new series. So in fact, it's actually uh, a little bit overdue. I've had this series in the pipeline for a good few months and really just down to personal priorities and workload, I've not been able to get the episodes out as quickly as I would like to, but we are definitely back and going to be publishing weekly content uh, for the foreseeable future as part of this series. And it's great to be back behind the mic. If you are new to the podcast and you're maybe discovering us for the first time, Welcome, first of all. Uh, if you're a regular listener, maybe you want to know what's going to be different or how we're going to mix things up a little bit as part of this series. So I don't often do solo episodes, as any of you that listen to the podcast regularly will know, because I just love to be a sponge and take in the knowledge that all of my guests have and can contribute in this space. Because you know, I know my way around the digital procurement and the tech landscape pretty well in terms of the breadth of solutions that are out there, especially some of the more niche ones that are perhaps not focusing on uh, big, huge enterprise level businesses and, uh, and complex implementations. I very much like to focus my attention on uh, the up, up and coming best of breed solutions that are carving out uh, a specific niche or are perhaps, you know, growing quite quickly. Uh, with a solution to a problem that hasn't yet been solved. But all of my guests bring a different aspect of the digital procurement spectrum and landscape uh, to the picture. And I love just tapping into into their experience uh, and, and getting to, to broadcast that to an audience. It, it really is a, a very fulfilling uh, vocation in that sense. So definitely planning to do predominantly guest-based episodes in this series. This one as an intro is a bit of an exception. So I'll dive straight in and just give a quick overview of what you can expect in the new series and to address some of the trends that, that I'm seeing and that we're seeing uh, in the procurement tech marketplace in general. So what is this series going to be about? Well, we're going to be concentrating predominantly on a pretty loose theme of overcoming objections and ensuring successful outcomes. And like I say, this series has been in the pipeline for a while. And it was interesting, actually, that in the process of me planning and actually getting this series out, two good friends and, and amazing contacts in this space, Matthias Gutzmann from DPW uh, and Phil Eidson from Art of Procurement, have also taken a, a similar theme, uh, well, for Phil's virtual conference that he did back in February, uh, all about digital outcomes. And for this year's DPW conference in Amsterdam, Matthias has also made uh, the main theme of, of the event to be making tech work. So I, I think we're all onto this, uh, we're all onto something here. And that is that, you know, there are so many botched digital transformations out there and, I think it's broadly recognized now much more widely than it was three years ago when I first started the podcast that just by investing in a piece of tech, it won't necessarily, it's not the magic bullet, it's not the magic wand, and it won't solve all of your underlying structural problems or uh, organizational issues uh, that may go with that. So we're going to do uh, a lot more episodes talking to experts in the fields of things like change management, proposing a business case, influence and persuasion developing the right talent, all of those sort of topics 
that are, are paramount into ensuring that you get buy-in and that you ultimately are successfully uh, able to implement the tech solution that you choose. I do definitely still hang on to the opinion that the choice of tech does matter. Some people say it doesn't. I, I definitely think it does. But of course, there are other underlying factors that are going to be more important than that. You know, if you uh, you can have the best tech platform in the world, you know, easy to use, good value for money, e- uh, simple to implement, fast to implement, integrates with other platforms, is really, really agile, has a great UX. But if your organization is fragmented, is immature, is decentralized, and you have no mandate from the C-suite, then you know, you're still probably going to fail. So really want to spend more time on diving into that with some of the episodes that we do in this series. I also wanted to touch on a few things that, that have been happening and, and, to set, and to share some thoughts or how we might be able to tackle some of these topics during this series. The first one is the acquisition of Cooper Software that was announced back in December and has since then taken place and gone through by Toma Bravo. You know, what will that mean? You know, a big, one of the big players, many will say a market leader, certainly in terms of the amount of market segment that they've captured. You know, I think it's fair to say that Cooper and, and SAP Ariba are the, are the two leading lights in terms of market capture, market share. Regardless of anyone's opinions on whether they think the tech's any good or not, that's a different, uh, that's a different story. What does that mean for our industry at large? And, you know, I shared some thoughts on that on LinkedIn just before Christmas. And, you know, while I do think Cooper will have to, will have to slim down and perhaps go after its, its core market, which in my opinion is definitely enterprise, I do think it shows that there is a lot of opportunity and a lot of interest in procurement technology. And that if you look at this more holistically and, you know, the wider space that Toma Bravo is invested in, uh, Cooper is a very neat fit in terms of other supply chain, you know, HR management platforms that are out there as kind of an alt suite to running uh, an ERP and trying to and trying to just plug solutions on top of an ERP. So I do think that the days of ERP potentially could be numbered and it will be interesting to see what the likes of SAP and Oracle do in this space as, as time goes on because you know their platforms are not agile, they're not easy to use and customers, especially now as, as more millennials are coming into leadership positions, are demanding that good user experience, UX, is part and parcel of the offering. So that's definitely an interesting trend. It will be interesting to see who wins out you know, with, with funding getting much, much more difficult now for some of the best of breed solutions that perhaps haven't got critical mass in terms of revenue or number of customers, will the likes of Cooper and Ariba, who in fairness, you know, recognized their weaknesses and implemented a, a marketplace, you know, similar to an app store, if you will, to allow best of breed technology to, to be bolted onto their solutions, will that become the norm and will they become you know, will they consolidate even more market share as being the go-to platform? Or will people then start to move away from them and realize that you can have something like a master data platform as your foundation and then perhaps plug on a standalone P2P application and a standalone contracts management application and a standalone risk management, ESG, sourcing, whatever you need to buy to fix your business's biggest issues, could we potentially see a move away from, you know, the Coopers, the Arebas, Jaggers, iValuers of the world as a platform? Uh, and could we see master data applications become that platform? I think that will be an interesting trend. I have an opinion on most things. I genuinely don't on this one. I could see it going either way. And if you gave me some money to bet, I would find it really hard which one I would put my money on. You know, best of breed with master data as the foundation or a suite based approach, but in future following a much more modular structure where users tend to pick and choose what modules they want rather than having to go out and buy the entire suite. I think that one's going to be a really interesting battle that we're going to see over the coming months and probably years. So watch this space. I genuinely 
don't know which way it will go. What I do think will happen is the best of breed solutions will continue to form partnerships and alliances with one another. And we'll probably even see a more formalized joint sales structure for some of these. I mean, if we look at the acquisition of Per Angusta by Spend HQ and how they've integrated or are integrating now, I think that serves as a great example that they they should be stronger together um, in terms of being able to offer that as a joint solution to their customers. So I think we'll see more and more of that. I'm certainly having a lot of conversations with procurement tech companies who are, are interested potentially in in looking at growing their alliances and partnership side of the business. Obviously, it's someone that has quite a lot of contacts in this space. And I do think that is a natural sales channel that doesn't really require much marketing. And it's more of a it's more of an alliance. And an, you know, if you're selling to a similar client base, but you're not directly competing with one another, it does seem to me like a no-brainer. You know, why wouldn't you do it? And I think we will start to see more and more of that as cold sales pipelines become harder and harder to get. And when funding is perhaps drying up to spend money on marketing and startups need a bit longer runway, this, this I think, will be more and more of a thing over the rest of the year and probably going into 2024 as well. Uh, just as an FYI, recording this at the end of April 2023, just for context. The other thing that I think will happen more and more, and indeed, you know, we're seeing it as well, is that procurement tech companies that are headquartered in emerging markets will continue to grow and disrupt. Maybe not going to conquer the United States or Europe, but will certainly become the go-to solutions in their home markets. Penny Software is a great example of that in Saudi Arabia and the Middle East, as is Yedu, uh, which is a Mexican procure to pay, pay platform that is gaining traction in uh, not just Mexico, but Latin America at large as well. I think these solutions offer something unique to their to, to their own geographical market, some of the nuances that are out there. And um, as this space matures, procurement technology matures, uh, we may not hear about them as much in in the US and in Europe, but I think in their own markets. And it's something that I'm starting to spend more time researching now, especially in terms of what's going on in the bigger ones like India and and Latin America. You know, what solutions are out there and how are they growing? Because logically, when you look at this space, even relatively small businesses are going to have to do some sort of digitization in terms of contract management, procure to pay, sourcing. And they don't have the money to spend on these massive suites that have got enterprise marketing budgets and enterprise price tags. So logic will suggest that either the tech solutions that are aimed at SMEs or mid-market from mature markets will branch into these more emerging markets. But I think what will what is more likely to happen will be that there will be these copycat solutions that come out in emerging markets and really nail the marketing and the sales strategy for their home market. So that's another one that I think we're going to be, ha- be watching very, very closely. I did actually uh, a YouTube video with my good friend, Dr. Mudassir Ahmed, when I was in Dubai in January talking about this topic. Uh, I'll link to it in the show notes because... Uh, he obviously approaches it more from the supply chain space because his channel and his business, SCM Dojo, focuses more on supply chain. But we talk a lot about the opportunities in, in emerging markets and, uh, and how, the, the, how the procurement tech or supply chain uh, tech landscape is, is different out there than it is in, in more mature markets. So definitely watch that one too. The other one, perhaps unsurprisingly for anyone who's listened to the podcast or or seen a lot of the content that I put out is I think the best of breed solutions will continue to poach business away from customers of some of the legacy all-in-one suites. And also, I happen to think that any suite providers that are coming in new to the market with new technology, we've got a couple of episodes coming up actually with Raindrop, who is who is a big player in that space. I think they will also continue to, they will also poach market share away from some of the more cumbersome legacy tech that's, in all honesty, looking pretty old hat these days. Why? Well, not only price, which obviously is a factor, but customers now need something 
that will provide ROI much, much faster than historically procurement technology has done. Nobody's got time now for a one-year implementation. And if you have, then (laughs) I would suggest you look elsewhere because you can save yourself a lot of money on consulting. Not only that, customers are demanding a much more customer-centric user experience for their software. You know, 25-year-olds that are coming into to procurement as junior buyers or as uh, as junior category managers are looking at some of the legacy, legacy tech and thinking, what the bloody hell is this? It looks awful, awful, and it feels awful. And, you know, why do I have to input something in an interface that feels like it's from the 1990s? Now, these folks don't know who Sonic the Hedgehog was that my generation was uh, was growing up with as a teenager. So they want something that looks and feels nicer. So I, I think that's an inevitable one. It's just a case of how long does it take? What else? Well, solution providers will evolve more into as-a-service businesses because what's definitely going to happen if you look at general trends in the growth of the gig economy is procurement teams ultimately will become smaller and more specialized and they will have to focus on their core objectives and then flex up and flex down with the workforce and use a lot more a lot more contingent labor and external service providers to satisfy some of the additional needs that they're perhaps not able to cover with their own headcount and one of these is you know, in the spend analytics and tail spend management space, Symphony is a great example of this, that they offer an as-a-service model with tail spend management and uh, and they've got an e-sourcing platform now in there as well. Uh, and they do, you know, monthly or quarterly data refresh of all of your spend data. And I, I just think that's going to happen more and more. I think we will see sourcing as a service from some of the e-sourcing platforms come into play. Uh, I think we will also have, you know, done for you type of contract management or vendor master data management type of model for the tech players that are in those types of platforms. I think the as a service model and the and the subscription model over and above a baseline software as a service, I think it will start to bring people factor into it more and more. Going back to the theme of successful outcomes and overcoming objections, I think not having the right talent and enough good talent in teams to be able to execute these tech tech platforms and run them like clockwork, getting the software provider to do it with the support of perhaps a senior category manager, you know, having that oversight just makes a lot of sense to me. And uh, it's a good way to flex up and take a, uh, and take advantage of that. And it's a great way for a software company to, to add an extra predictable and stable revenue stream uh, to their business model as well. And then last but not least, I touched on it earlier, but VC funding is going to continue to be tough for startups. And what I'm hearing in the marketplace is that while it's not as difficult for early stage companies to get funding, uh, it is getting much, much harder uh, for Series B, Series C. So for companies that have grown up to a point and are looking for that next big batch of funding to really kick on, maybe expand beyond their home market or spend more money on sales and marketing or add different product features, that is getting more and more difficult for everything that I'm hearing out there. We've kind of got to the point now that all of the early adopters of procurement tech have adopted it. <laughs> and we're kind of left now that we, we've kind of stuttered a little bit on the growth, on the bell curve. And the challenge now for anyone in sales and marketing at a procurement tech company is going to be, okay, the early adopters get it. And yes, there are still a certain amount of them to go after that maybe haven't solved what we do yet. But then how do I tap into that next wave? You know, when you're when you're starting to then encroach on older school procurement leaders, I'm using my language carefully, that's when it gets much, much harder. And I say this from experience, you know, trying to sell anything to procurement leaders that are not particularly progressive is really, really difficult. You know, I know that from bitter experience having tried to sell to sell consulting. So I think that's going to be a really interesting and tough challenge for anyone in the procurement tech space. 
And I'll be interested also to see how that plays out, whether it be consolidation in the market or just some of these older school procurement leaders just ending up getting pushed out because the CEO and the CFO are insistent on on driving digital transformation and taking that agenda forward. It will be an interesting couple of years in that sense. So that rounds off the very first introduction uh, episode of Series 4. Like I say, this one's going to be much more diverse in terms of guests and content. We'll be branching out from the more traditional episodes that we've done where typically I've interviewed a startup founder or or their chief revenue or marketing officer and we've spoken a little bit about their software. We're still going to do those, but they're going to be more of the sponsored episodes that we'll, that we'll slot in uh, every two or three weeks, but it won't form the backbone of the content as it has done in the past. We're going to mix it up and make it a lot more interesting for really a wider audience that we want to try and attract into spreading the word on procurement technology. So if you're a procurement tech rookie, uh, if you're curious but don't know all of the tech terms and the termino- and, and the players in the space and uh, and all of the different jargon, don't worry. Uh, we'll do plenty of episodes that are aimed at people that are just dipping their toes into this space as well to really try and bring as many people as possible onto the digitization journey because I genuinely believe with the right setup, with the right talent and with the right platform, you can really make things better for your procurement team. Free them of all of the busy work, eliminate, delegate and automate is my motto. And if you can save a lot of time on a lot of the administrative tasks and non-value added work, that's where initially you're going to see biggest benefit. Yes, there are all the, all these fancy AI, machine learning, automated negotiations. Yes, it's fantastic. It gets me excited. But fundamentally, if you can't automate most of your procure to pay and tactical sourcing operations, then really... You're, you're on a hiding to nothing. That's where you have to start in most cases. So thank you for listening. It's a pleasure to have you along as always. Please subscribe to the show where you listen to your podcasts. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts if you like what you hear. That helps us to reach more people. We also have a monthly newsletter where we give a roundup of everything that's happening in the procurement tech space. Go to procurementsoftware.site and the sign-up form is on the homepage. And yeah, we will speak to you again same time next week. And until then, take care wherever you are and bye for now.